session, please use the chat function that Ron has, has put up there, um, and these questions will be picked up later in the session. So I'm Gail Bogue, I'm Dean of the Business School at Edinburgh Napier University, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this webinar hosted by the Business School. It's one in a series where we invite global leaders to share their thoughts, experiences and insights on a number of different topics. And today I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Ewan Jarvey, CEO of Denzu Aegis UK. Now, Ewan is originally from Creef. He graduated with a BA Ons in Business Studies from Edinburgh Napier in 1990, and then work, went on to work with a number of leading agencies such as WWAV, Rat Collins, Mediacom, Carrot. He joined Denzu Ages Network, or DAN, almost three years ago and has been the UK Chief Exec for just over a year. Now, Dan is the UK part of the world's largest digital media marketing agency and has 4,000 UK employees approximately and works um, with many household names, including Rolls-Royce, Cadbury and Aegon, to name just a, a few. Ewan's achievements have included leading and building the largest media agency in Scotland, which were Business of the Year in 2005 and 2006. He's rebuilt a media agency in Ireland within six months, and he's pitched and won billion dollar pitches and has been quoted as saying that mostly he is proud to have consistently delivered succession from within and watched these businesses continue to flourish. So his goal is very much to build and improve on businesses with like minded people with complementary skills who have integrity, humour and ambition. And on that note, I'd like to pass directly to Ewan and invite him to share his thoughts about who got it right with digital and innovating the way brands are built. Welcome, Ewan, and over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Gail. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope uh, I hope you find the next uh, 20, 25 minutes uh, interesting. I'm going to give you a perspective on what we refer to as the pendulum dynamic, but I guess as Gail suggested, it's really about our our perspective on some of the winners in the, in the most recent uh, crisis that we're actually still living through. Um, I am, uh, as uh, as, I, as Gail did actually identify correctly, uh, very old, and I did graduate in 1990, much to both my surprise and probably everyone else in my uh, in my family. Uh, as I come from a family of doctors, and becoming a business graduate was something uh, unheard of. But let me just jump into. Uh, so a little bit of history, because hopefully it'll frame uh, what this is really about. And I think the lessons that we learn from business are really by observing and trying to build and putting the, the, the properties together to see where people have either made mistakes or really been ambitious and, and challenging and brave. If we go back to the year 2000, because um, I remember it, uh, the reality was then that the, the five largest market capitalization businesses in the world were, as you can see, Microsoft, GE, NTT, Cisco, and, and Walmart. And they had a, a just over a $2 trillion uh, market capitalization. Now, some of these may be household names to many of us, but in terms of where they sit now, they're in very, very different places. And really, what I'm going to talk you through is, is what we believe has happened and, and why these things have happened. So in the period following 2000, the, the period of 2010 to 2020, there was a whole growth in the e-commerce space with the likes of Groupon coming online, Google Wallet, Apple Pay, and even actually just the Facebook, uh, its proposition. And if you go back through the history of Facebook, one of the things you'll find that the Mark Zuckerberg is famous as of saying is that in the first 10 years of their existence, the one thing they missed was mobile. There was no mobile capability inside of Facebook or for their platform. And that meant that they were a really uh, stagnating business and they couldn't really generate revenues. But in this e-commerce decade, what it did is it accelerated consumer change and financial change and how we transacted, but also how we did the things we, we used to do as human beings and consumers. And you leap to September 2020, the market capitalization of the top five businesses in the world today are nearly seven trillion dollars. So almost three and a half times that of 20 years ago. 
But what you'll, I, I hope, notice most apparently is that with the exception of Microsoft, all the rest of them are new. So you have Apple, you have Amazon, you have Alibaba. The reality here is that the major organizations which are creating wealth in the, in the world today and are growing faster are those that are predicated against technology and digitization. And I think that's what's really important when you look at what's been going through. Because although the world's population in the period of 10 years has only grown by around about 12%, the volume of mobile access has accelerated by over seven and a half times. So the accessibility through, to, through technology to a whole swathe of new services and offerings is at an unprecedented level. And what that's doing is it's driving consumer behavior and consumer demand. And the result of it is really quite simple. In 2020, the global e-commerce sales profile globally was around 4.2 trillion. We're expecting that to reach about 6.5 trillion in the next three years. And to contextualize it, the GDP of the UK is only $2.74 trillion. So e-commerce, which in 2000 was a very small, slightly conflicted proposition against bricks and mortar retail uh, offerings, is now an enormous industry. It's actually one of the leading parts of, of revenue generation for corporations across the world. So we sit in, in September, or rather October, 2020, at a period where e-commerce is driving a huge amount of wealth, but we're also sitting right in the middle of a global pandemic. And we've just gone in as business organizations, as advertisers and marketeers, through one of the most challenging reversals that I've ever encountered in 30 years. And what we saw was basically things just stopping. Things have pivoted before, and it's not an expression I particularly enjoy because I'm not sure what pivoting genuinely means. To me, it's perhaps a little of uncertainty. But what happened in the last seven months is commerce stopped. We went home. We didn't go out. We didn't spend. To the extent that when it first started, we couldn't spend. We weren't allowed into supermarkets. It changed the entire dynamic of how consumers did what they did, but also what their expectations were. And that had an enormous impact on the overall economic position globally. And these are the three stock market trends from both Japan, New York and London. And what you saw in the middle of March is a stratospheric drop in the overall wealth of those markets and those nations. Now, you're seeing it climb out, but the UK, which is the black line on this slide, has been much slower to climb out. Um, we in our business actually study recessions very, uh, very extensively going all the way back into the early 1980s and early 1990s. And what we're seeing from recessions is they're faster and they're deeper, but the recovery is quicker. And we would suggest in consumer marketing, that is actually down to a, a, some fairly simple mechanics. The e-commerce uh, opportunities are accelerating people's opportunity to purchase, and there are more platforms for not just immediacy, but also knowledge and data recovery. So businesses are more confident that they can get better returns and they can adjust and adapt much more quickly. So yeah, we are in a, in a global pandemic and there's been significant changes to what's happening, more so, no more so than actually what happened immediately. The winners and losers in terms of categories in this pandemic were quite stark. In less than three weeks, the world nearly sold out of resistance bands for some extreme reason. And there was a massive surge in sweat gear, people buying it for home, and, and bizarrely, bread making kits. But on the other side of the fence, strangely, luggage wouldn't sell because you couldn't travel. The photography industry almost collapsed overnight because people, again, weren't traveling. But bizarrely in the UK, there was almost a 100% drop in the sale of teenagers' training shoes. And the reason for that, we believe, is that kids just weren't going out anywhere, and therefore they weren't wearing out or kicking off their shoes. Now, that's a big problem if you're Adidas. The other thing I think it's important to, to recognize as advertising, we're always in search of, of, of audiences. And what we saw in this pandemic was almost universal increase in the consumption of media, but very specific media was being consumed. So there was no live events. So as you can see to the extreme right, there's a massive increase in the consumption of box sets and repeats and all four. But there was almost an unprecedented increase in the viewership of the BBC's news. 
And that is really down to the fact that the entire world was focusing on what was happening. But we have seen and experienced a dramatic increase in the available audiences at the same time when advertising revenues in the United Kingdom fell off a cliff. Ad revenues work in a, almost a direct correlation to the stock market and the GDP of the country. So that correlative view of the stock market is fairly indicative of what the advertising revenue market was doing. So if you're thinking about it from a pure advertising perspective, there was a lot of people to see and a lot of people to reach, but there wasn't a great deal of money in the market to actually extend those brands. So those people who then address that challenge, I think are the, one, the ones where we would say have used the pendulum dynamic very effectively. So let me talk to you about what it is. Simply, and it's rare and, and probably dangerous for, for a marketeer like myself to talk to any academics about theories, but. In 1602, Galileo described and created what is called a pendulum dynamic or the theory of pendulums, which is that of the government of action of gravity and acquired momentum. And the reason it works effectively is it swings back and forth between two opposite extremes. And those opposite extremes do change, but the reality is the, the fundamental basis of gravity and momentum create this dynamic. Now, if we think about how does that work in a business world? Let me talk you through very uh, three very quick cases. And these are clients that we'd represent across the UK and across the globe. And you may think, well, I wonder how successful they are, how well you know them. And most people recognize both Microsoft and Kellogg's. I hope some of you will know and recognize the very group, but I'll tell you a little bit about that. But all of these businesses have done, I think, extraordinary things in the last nine months. So let me talk to you about the Very Group. And the Very Group was born out of Littlewoods, which if you are um, certainly in, in my time of life, you'll understand Littlewoods used to not just be a department store, but was actually one of the, the leading mail order houses in the, in the United Kingdom. And they expanded their business over a number of years into both a bricks and mortar, but also a, a catalog style business that went into e-commerce. Now, during this pandemic, they have radically adapted and accelerated their digitization, but also their speed of transactions and customer attention. So what they're doing is things in a much more agile space. They've, they've changed their business because they're not just essentially a, an e-commerce business, they're actually an e-commerce finance business because they extend credit. And that's where catalog or mail order businesses actually originated from. But what the very group did is they extended credit to people who had never considered it before. And if you consider the world we are in right now and just coming out of, furlough was not a, a, an expression we were very familiar with two years ago. But can you imagine how many people would have been looking for credit in the last nine months who would never have looked for it before? And what the very group then did is they also went after and started to hunt down new customers. So very simply, we break it down for the very group. The websites radically increased across this period in COVID. Now, from the examples I've shown you about what's happening in media across broadcast platforms, it's fairly, it's fairly common uh, understanding and logical to suggest there's a big increase. But that then precipitated almost immediate increases in retail sales. Now, their business was based historically on fashion and clothing. Uh, but they pivoted very quickly into electronics and actually home entertainment, so garden, uh, toys, games, etc. And they pretty much sold out of electronics in the first three weeks of lockdown, almost unheard of for them. Uh, but what happened there is that the margin inside of their business did change because the margin in fashion was much higher than it was in the in the goods that they were selling. So they were doing well, but their overall business was not making as much money. Um, and that and that sort of mainly sort of got them to a place to think, well, how are we going to do this differently? So very quickly, what they did, um, the headline is for the first time in their entire history, they're going to hit almost two billion pounds worth of annualized sales in one of the big, biggest pandemics and, and economic crisis that we've ever seen. Ninety five percent of their sales are via credit accounts and they extended importantly payment deferrals to customers existing and new. And that brought a whole swathe of new people into their business. So what they ended up with was an increase of more than double of their new customers in the three months when they went into the pandemic and doubled their market share. And the reason they did it is that they were listening and understanding principally what was in front of them. The customers they had were not able to spend as much money 
and the, the products they were selling were not as profitable. So what they did is they went to find more customers who didn't use their services before, but moreover, were not credit hungry in the past. So really interesting and I think incredibly brave strategy and has proven to be extremely successful. And that is part of that pendulum dynamic, that momentum and gravity is so important for a business like the Very Group and has proven to be huge, hugely successful. Now, Kellogg's isn't something that we talk about a great deal in marketing circles, but it is, as you would imagine, one of the largest companies in the world and it's a mainstay. But they have three things that have done exceptionally well for them in the last six to nine months. That is their brand integrity, the range and the innovation they have, and fundamentally value for money that they have. And we created with them a focus to thrive, as we called it. And that was really based on ensuring that there was an emotional priming to what we were doing, that we needed to help them understand and communicate that people could feel good about the things that were still good, even though we were in a global pandemic. And that was around reinforcing the trust and integrity that Kellogg's has. It is one of the most recognized brands. It is one of the few things that almost every household has. And actually, at a time when there was significant challenges in the supply chains of packaged goods, cereals last much longer than most other things in terms of sell-by dates, and they are actually very easy to, to transport uh, because of the way in which they're packed and, and the, the logistics of the Kellogg's business in the United Kingdom. So they then started to do a number of other things. They extended the physical duration of their advertising, i.e. rather than running things for three to four weeks, they started extending them over a seven to eight week period. And it just gave them a much bigger saliency and, and, and impact across the, the duration of their campaigns. But they also started to extend the range of their activities. Through that, they then built more trust into some of their larger associations with other partners, people like Disney and Adidas, but they then took a very radical step change for them. They're historically a broadcast advertiser uh, who puts the big box on television with the big red K. What they started to do is embrace uh, the social influencing world and started to get other people to talk more effectively about not just the taste proposition of what Kellogg's delivers, but that sustainability and also the credibility of what they have as a business and a brand as a product. And that was incredibly successful for them. Now, Kellogg's, as you will, sh I'm sure, know and recognize do cornflakes and Rice Krispies, but they also own Pringles and they extended a lot of their business into cereal bars in the last number of years. And the reason for that was there was a huge drop off in breakfast consumption as a, as a meal. Now, as you would expect, cereal bars were in decline and have been in decline in the pandemic because their principal use was for people on the move. And therefore, if people aren't going anywhere, there's nowhere near the same level of requirement. But what we've seen for the first time in a long time is that breakfast is becoming more important. It's becoming a significant part of everybody's day. And it's starting to bridge across all the ages in society. And Kellogg's have seen a significant increase in their European sales in the first half of this year and their UK sales in both uh, value and volume for the first time in a very long time. And it's likely to be one of their best sales periods ever. And we're putting this down to the fact that they've delivered something that's extremely important for, for consumers at this particular moment in time. Trust and credibility is absolutely critical when there's so much uncertainty in the world. And something as simple as a breakfast cereal may seem quite mundane, but it's incredibly reassuring to know that what you have in that box will be the same day in, day out. What they've also been able to do is embrace the digitization of the world or the socialization of the world and get new influencers to start to talk about the usage and the efficacy of their products. And that's expanded the range and the appeal of the Kellogg's portfolio, particularly in cereals, to a whole new range and, and, and audience base. Uh, and it's proven to be enormously successful. So, you know, the next time somebody looks at a, a box of all brown and thinks it's boring, I would, I would challenge them to say, actually, there's a lot more to it than it's just a, a brown box in the corner. And let me talk to you very lastly about Microsoft. This is a, an organization we've worked with for many years, fascinating company. Um, but there's four things I think that are worth calling out here. There was a massive cultural shift pre the pandemic in how Microsoft did what they did. They moved almost exclusively into a cloud-based business. 
they started to actually get themselves into the modern world, which sounds a bit extreme for a, one of the leading technology companies, but become real time. And I think the bit that makes the difference for Microsoft is they've become a customer focused business as opposed to a consumer focused business. And I'll explain a little bit about what that means. This is the gentleman I believe is absolutely critical to the success that Microsoft has. So when Satya Nadella became the new CEO at Microsoft, one of the things he talked about was renewing the company's culture. And it was his highest priority. And to give you an example of what he means is he wanted to understand, as it says there, where people were coming from, what makes them tick inside of Microsoft. And if you study any of the history of Bill Gates and Steve Bollinger and those guys who worked in that business for many years, it was a challenged culture. It was a very confrontational, aggressive culture. What Satya did was very, very interesting. He completely focused back inside of the company. And what that meant is they went into COVID. They were in a much stronger place, a much more collegiate spirit as a business, which meant they could move very, very quickly. As you'd expect for a business that's high in technology, demand rose at a stratospheric level. You know, the volume of users on Teams more or less doubled in the first three weeks of the pandemic. And that's a that's a product that's been around since 2015. Um, they were selling in April each week the equivalent of the, the global sales of Black Friday, which is the major uh, annualized sales event, particularly in the States. And they sold out the, the latest edition of Xbox in three hours. Now, this is one of the largest companies in the world with a market capitalization today bigger than the top five in, 20, in 2000. So what you're seeing is an enormous demand on a business, which historically was just about getting boxes out of factories and shipping them through a retail distribution chain. And that was that. If you asked Microsoft at the turn of the century who they were selling to, they probably wouldn't be able to tell you. But in the new era, in a customer orientated era, they were very much aware of who they were selling to and had extreme dialogue both into consumer marketing but also into business marketing so their enterprise and their commercial products also accelerated in growth almost to 20 percent by the midpoint of this year it's a really fascinating story and what Satya Nadal said is he's seen a transformation in his business in two months that's the equivalent of two years and the reason for that is they focused about how do they apply the technology they create to the customers they have to make sure that they are long term customers. They reacted more quickly to the pandemic than any technology company. So what they did with Teams, as an example, is they accelerated not just the development and the entry price, but actually the usage base. So pre this pandemic, the usage quantity on Teams was about 11 people that became 30, then 50, then 80 in the space of less than three weeks. And that is because the Microsoft organization was listening to its customers and it actually pivoted very quickly to get to a place to go, we are responding to what you need and what you want. The end result, as you can see, is the stock for Microsoft, not just through this pandemic, but pre this pandemic, has more or less doubled in the last three years. And it, it's, it rightfully sits at the top of the, the market cap or the leading companies of the world. And the reason I believe it will stay there is that culturally it is led from a customer point of view as opposed to a technology point of view, which I think is the, the key going forward. So if I look to summarize, well, what, what are we taking out of this? What is this pendulum dynamic? Well, simply, there's the, you need the adaptability and the foresight and the willingness to, to, to adapt to the swing quickly. So what your customers are doing, what is happening in the market. This pandemic has shown those businesses that are able to actually respond in their business as opposed to in their rhetoric. You secondarily have to deliver what the customer needs. So if you consider Galileo's principle, I would suggest that's probably more closely aligned to gravity. The customer is the gravitational pull and what they need is what they have to have because our acceleration in digitization, if nothing else, has made us extremely demanding and, ex and our expectations are extraordinarily short. And if you pull this through into the world of people such as Kellogg's or the Very Group, what they're doing is they're building trust and that is having the accelerator of momentum, if you will.
So trust is such an important element. In, in the work that I've done around the world and, and the agencies I work with, and, and Gail mentioned at the top, sometimes we get opportunities to pitch for clients' businesses that can be worth a billion pounds or more in, in what they spend every year. And I would say to any CEO I worked with in our networks when I worked at WPP or when I work at Dentsu, I go to a country, I would say to them, where is your billion dollar pitch team? To which most people would say, we don't have one yet, but when the pitch arrives, we'll build it. Well, that is too late. And it's a little bit like trust. The trust that businesses have has got to see them into the best days and the worst days. Nobody saw this pandemic coming, um, certainly not on a commercial or financial footing. But the momentum that trust will give you gets you through this because what you deliver at a time when people are either under pressure financially or emotionally is a seat at the table. So the pendulum dynamic is much more about the swing of what happens as opposed to constantly changing direction. There is a momentum and the best businesses maintain the momentum by adding new things to it. So I hope you found that uh, interesting and valuable or, or not, but uh, I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Ian, thank you. That's a fascinating presentation. Um, we, we've got some questions that are coming through. And, and just to reiterate to people, if, if they want to add any points into the chat, then I'll post those questions to you as we go. But um, just as a, a starter, the, the examples that you've given today are global brands, are, are organisations that have the, the and the capacity, as you said, to pivot rapidly. But within the a, a new client, what's the onboard process? How do, you know, how do you get smaller scale clients to take on board some of those um, opportunities and, and make it viable for them at, at a different scale of organisation? Well, look, it's it's a it's a great question. It really is. Um, I mean, the one thing that all businesses share, big and small, uh, is customers. And um, if you have customers or you have a desire to have customers, the the most important thing I think is to is to understand them to the best degree. What we look to do is we look to own that human centricity as a business. So we would we would suggest that we are world experts in human understanding. Uh, the reason for it is if you spend all your time like, say, a Microsoft has done or like Greg's the Baker have done, you will spend a lot of time looking at what the product is coming out. So it is the world's greatest piece of software or the world's greatest vegan sausage roll. But the point of the matter is it doesn't, it doesn't work unless you really understand what the end consumer and customer wants and needs. And are you actually satisfying it? Are you satisfying that desire? So as we onboard clients, big and small, and in the UK, we've got around about 3,000 clients, and they range from Jaguar Land Rover to Microsoft, um, all the way down to very localized solicitor firms and marketing services companies and, uh, and the likes. And what we look to do is partner with them to understand what's the market opportunity, What's your unique position and what is the customer base you're looking to talk to really want and need and that you can fill that gap for better? That's great. I've got a question from, from Jamie. As marketers begin to develop more converged media plans across both traditional and digital platforms, what KPIs do you look towards as the metrics for success yeah. if it's like a holistic multi-channel campaign? Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a great question because I can assure you the very largest advertisers in the world probably still have some of the most old fashioned KPIs. I mean, the best KPI you can look for has got to be the return on your investment. So you've got to be able to understand, is it making an impact? And that can be really simply put into, does it move the sales barometer? Does it improve brand health? Um, and more importantly, now than ever before, does it retain your customers? So there's no simple singular KPI for any individual business. But if you take a very simple analogy, it costs you a lot of money to find a new customer. It costs you significantly less to keep it. So retention of your customers is a hugely valuable investment. And the KPI around that is really about understanding your customers again. You've got to know who they are. 
Um, because if you don't know who, who they are, you'll know, you won't know if they're staying with you. Uh, and then what you end up doing is spending a lot of money trying to reconvert what is actually an existing customer when you think they're new. But yeah, I think, look, the marketing services um, has sort of danced around accountability for far too long. You know, there's a lot of people saying, well, it's about, it's about the art. It's not, it's the art and the science. Creativity leads it for sure, but it has to be accountable both to the financials of the business, but also it's got to be accountable to, to, to the customer at the end of the day. So brand health, brand trust is incredibly important, more so than ever before. But financial KPIs, sales, return on investment, yeah, definitely. Lots of metrics. So the, the dashboard, unfortunately, Jamie, got a lot bigger uh, and it's getting bigger, uh, which makes my life certainly more challenging. But uh, it also means if you've got accountability, you're valid. You're valid in the conversation. And as a marketer, you have to be, you've got to be delivering something that is credible and valid. Fantastic. You, you may, sorry, Gil. Sorry, can I just jump in and ask a, a supplementary question to that, Ewan? So thinking about our graduates and obviously them thinking about careers they want to go into. And, and I certainly know when I was at university and graduating, I thought I had nothing better to do than go into a world of advertising because it looked really attractive with um, lots of exciting clients and, and gin and tonics all the time. But of course, it's not really like that. But what is what are the key skills that you would be looking for if you were or presumably you do employing a large number of graduates every year what, what are you looking for uh so, so we we hire on behaviors first and intellect second um because the reality is as a graduate there's there's two things uh, i so the, the advice i give every graduate is you know you have to know who you're talking to so we get we we hire about I think we hire about 150 graduates a year across our 25 businesses in the UK. Uh, we get about 4,000 unsolicited uh, approaches from undergraduates, but but the vast majority of them are very vague. You know, I, I do your research, so know who you're talking to, and explain to the organisations what you know about them, why you think you're a good fit, and give a point of view. Um, the, the second piece of advice, um, which may sound a little strange, is this, and it's not just to graduates, but it's anyone starting in a career, is don't be in a hurry to be the CEO. Uh, because the reality is two things. Um, one, and this is a little crude, so please forgive me, but it's something that was told to me many years ago. The only thing in the world that defies gravity is shit. And when you're at the CEO level, unfortunately, that's what you get a lot. You get a lot of problems. But the other side of it is, and think about it this way, if you want to be the leader of a business, you want to be the CEO, and you get that job very early, you're never going to get promoted again because that's the top of the tree. Um, but you can't have all the answers, so learn it well. So I would say know who you're talking to. Uh, if you have a passion, for advertising or marketing or media, then really demonstrate that you understand what that passion is about and have a point of view. Um, but it's competitive, so you have to be relentless and you really got to want to get in. But once you get in, be patient. This is a very fluid, dynamic business. I started off as a television buyer. I bought TV airtime um, for essentially Saatchi and Saatchi. And, and in those days, uh, advertising was quite far down the, the pecking order and media particularly was way down the pecking order. Media is now the center of not just marketing, it's the center of business. It's actually the center of commerce, uh, as we've just seen. So things can change even in a, you know, a relatively short period of time, like the time I've been in this career. So patience uh, and homework, I think, is probably the, the main things I would say. That's great, Ewan. We've, we've got a, a question that um perhaps reflects some of that uh, initial that start out journey um both for clubs here so uh, Anne and Catherine are asking um you've talked a lot about trust and the importance that that plays but if you're working with a new business a startup or a, a relatively small club how can they go about establishing that trust how can they use the marketing tools to, to accelerate that process? So uh, up until very recently, Ron, I think it's an incredibly difficult thing for people to do quickly. 
because you have to earn it. You can't buy it. Um, I would say, however, that reinforced trust and credibility can be achieved much more quickly in the modern era through the world of social influencing. So the right social influencers, not necessarily with the largest following, but with the real, the real sort of credibility. Credibility is where trust will come from. <clears throat> so if people who are credible are talking well of you, it does accelerate your trust. And for small brands, small businesses, it, trust is equally important because advertising is the stimulus that's come off word of mouth and word of mouth is because people trust you. Uh, and therefore that's how that basis works. So it can be done and it's easier today than, than, than it's ever been before, but it's not a simple thing because you have to consistently live up to what you say you're going to do and you've got to go beyond what other competitors are doing. That's where the trust piece comes from. So a great follow-up question here from Pete uh, on that, which I, I have to pose to you. Um, on that basis, how would you market higher education, both during and post-COVID? Um, it's a great question. Um, and I feel I'm completely exposed talking in this forum, but I'll give that a crack. Um, look, so my, my view on it is, why do people why do people want to learn stuff when you have a choice and higher education you know why did i go to to university well i wanted did i want to learn more things probably i didn't maybe articulate it that way but what i wanted to do is give myself a fighting chance to to go a little further maybe so how i would market it so i think the learning piece is important but the education doesn't come just from a book and I think you've got to be able to show what the output of it is so that marketing education is incredibly competitive. I spent four years living in America uh, and running a business out there, and, and it's a hugely commercial venture education. And there's possibly more of that coming here now. And therefore having a really strong point of view as, a, as an educational establishment. But I think as a, as a learning place, because education and learning can sometimes be a bit confusing. I think as a as a learning forum and as a, a a place where people come together and just become better, I think it's it's really important. But you've got to put real people in the middle of it. Uh, and that's the important bit. It can't be too glossy. Uh, and I think sometimes, I think sometimes big educational establishments try and make themselves into big brands, and the brand are just the people. You know, I think you've got to be able to show that more effectively. So that's where. I would dangerously suggest that might be the direction you would go. That's great. And um, I know that within our uh, marketing courses, they, there's a, a new module now where um, the students are doing the Google Analytics certificate as part of the, the module. Um, so it's that combination of you know the theory and very up to date you know, applied skills that will build the campaign. So um, hopefully the uh, the Edinburgh Napier graduates will, will still stand out on that uh, podium. Well, absolutely, and I'd encourage them to do the Twitter flight school as well. That's very contemporary. It's free. It's available. It shows you how you build social influencing properties as well. So I think the more of that you can get, it, the better, because uh, uh, you need as much ammunition as you can when you get into uh, the world of work. You talked earlier about the, the story of, of Very and, and the, um, I think you said that they had basically uh, brought in 100% of new customers within the, the period of COVID. They, they kind of doubled their yeah. uh, customer uh, base. And, you know, when you're trying to, was that proposition built around the flexibility of payments? Because they were all also pivoting, you said, in terms of the product range. So, what, what was the lead message that appealed so much to a, a brand new client base for them? I think simply what, what happened was there was a there's a client, there was a customer base that they probably never would have attracted before, which was it, it's the old Littlewoods business. And why would I want to pay £15 a month for something that will take me 60 weeks? Um, what they did is they said to people, we can get you the new technology today if you're on furlough. I can give you credit on furlough. And that's yeah. that's that's just smart. It's it's a listening mentality and a reactivity. 
because what they had to do is they had to change the, 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 the direction of where they were promoting their business, but also what they were promoting as, a, as, a, as an advertising platform. Um, so what products they were looking to sell, but they then started to really localize it. So you would see different messaging in Manchester versus Liverpool based upon the economic position and the, the volume of trades and furloughed employees in those spaces. It's just a really smart thing to do. And what that's got is you've got people into that business who probably didn't want or need credit ever before and will probably never need it again, but they'll be very customers for an extraordinarily long time now. And you talked about the example with Kellogg's as well of the extended period of the campaigns. Yes. Is, is that a trend that you're seeing much more broadly uh, on digital platforms now that people are you know, providing budgets to rather than for a, a short, sharp impact, that they're looking for that longer um, pace time, I guess, you know, that awareness building? It, 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 it's very much dependent on the type of products and the type of sector you're in. So the, the olden days of a four to six week advertising campaign, so boom and bust, pretty much went um, because the reality is the conversation opportunity can go much longer than that. All, all advertising campaigns are fully integrated now um, for, for anyone who wants to get a positive result. If you don't integrate it, uh, you end up with a, just an amorphous mass of things that don't really work. Uh, the, the duration of it, moreover, particularly performance media, which is high, high digital media, uh, the consumers and the budget will dictate when it ends because most people have a finite amount of money but so therefore if you can if you can pay it back quickly then it, it can continue longer what kellogg's did is they realized that at a time where you saw all those viewing figures going through the roof and the digitization and their new social platforms they realized that there was a huge available audience who were pivoting into a space or looking into a space where their products were more relevant and there was a huge depression uh, advertising market, which meant there was capacity. So they could make their money go a lot further. That's great. We've, we've got a follow-up question as well about the earlier discussion around Berry and, and just, um, has there been any, uh, whether it's responsible, responsible lending for them to um, extend credit that way? Have they had a, you know, how do, you talked about listening to the customer. Have they been able to assess how that's getting picked up at the moment, other than simply sales have gone up in the short term? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, th th those businesses, the, the Little Woods, the Grattons, the, the, these organizations, they're essentially finance businesses uh, and their risk management is extremely good. I mean, they, they've run a risk profile book for 70, 80 years. So the reality is what they did is they looked at individuals in a credit scoring fashion that was relevant to their historical position, as opposed to not just where they were right now. Um, is it responsible? Yeah, it is responsible because it's, it's a bit like a lot of things right now. Um, we don't know how long the pandemic will last, but we're very confident that it will not prevail in perpetuity. So there'll be an end to it. And therefore, a lot of these people had a short term cash flow issue, and that's where these sorts of companies and we're very were smart i think and really i thought brave as they stepped up and said we want to help i mean yes it helps them but it, it was a huge support and their their customer base particularly in the northwest of england um was strong but it has just got stronger and i think they've probably given themselves uh, a bedrock for the next generation of customers um which i think is fairly unprecedented that's great. Good answer. Thank you. You, you talked as well about um, localization. Um, and I guess one of the other, uh, the flip side of that, as um, you know, if a client comes to you and says, we want to enter the market and uh, look at exports to grow the business, you can facilitate that within the group. But if a smaller business is looking to use e-commerce to enter new markets. Would you recommend that they work with uh, an agency maybe locally that they know or an agency local to the market they want to enter? Whoa, that's a great question. 
because uh, I could probably do myself out of revenue here if I if I'm... <laughs> um, so I think um, look going with with local agencies is always the best way because businesses sell on the ground. You know, there's very few actual global organizations, uh, cultures, currencies, economics, they all fluctuate locally. So having someone close to it is very important. The advantage I suppose that we have as a global network is we're a connected business that can help people in Scotland uh, sell things in Japan or in Asia or in South America because we can manage some of that for them. Uh, we're also we can ensure that there's consistency to um, how you build things, so how you build consumer understanding, how you build economic or econometric modeling. So there's no inconsistency, and I suppose that's a credibility issue. Um, it's a really difficult one to be specific about. If you said, well, there's a shop or there's a business here that does this, then I would go, well, actually, I think maybe that's the way. At a generic sort of macro level, Ron, I think it's a, it, it, it's very easy to get that one wrong. Um, what you do need is you, you have to go back to the adage, which is people buy things in their proximity. You know, they buy stuff locally, whether that's locally online, it's still locally. And where do they get their credibility from? There's still an element of, um, I guess, sort of clustering or or pack. We get we get our confidence from the people we know and the people we talk to, and, and that's very much localized. That's a, I, I think you've managed to save that one for the for the network there. You you answered that one well. Um, Thank you. <laughs> campaigns and you, you started your career with TV advertising um, within the you know if you take an average marketing budget if there is such a thing you know not the global players but um, a more typical example would where does the e-commerce fit within that now in terms of the proportion of budget that will go uh, it's it's again it's a really good question. So I mean, until probably four or five years ago, you had uh, you had a fairly separate e-commerce side of of most client businesses, particularly in in sort of high end consumer any consumer goods, you know, professional services slightly differently. But let's focus it on consumer goods. Um, but if you go back fifteen years, you used to get a digital team or business which was separate to the main business. What you now have is you've got the traditional advertising platforms, the digital platforms in performance, the social platforms, and an e-commerce proposition. And the pendulum dynamic we talk about is really predicated on the fact that most businesses want to find more consumers to turn into customers, and then glean more information from their customers to retain them, but to reverse that knowledge back out to find more like-minded consumers to convert them back to customers. And very few organizations are able to connect it all together because they can't find one person to do it, but also they don't have the technological infrastructure to share one simple version of the truth. So the sales organization, the marketing organization, the digital organization, and the e-commerce organization all have different metrics and KPIs to the point and the question I think Jamie asked before, but moreover, they then start to look at it through a slightly different lens. So what you do need to do, integration is about knowledge uh, and, and, and utilization of it. And you do that by having the same set of information. Um, so going forward, yeah, I, I think you have to have it in the same place. So those businesses starting now will have e-commerce as a core part of their business. The more traditional companies like Coca-Cola as example, so we work for them in a number of countries around the world, so they they do actually have quite a significant e-commerce proposition, but if you go to places like Japan, that's because they own an enormous amount of digital vending machines. That's e-commerce because they are temperature controlled, they're Wi-Fi enabled, and they're Bluetooth, and they've got a, a payment mechanic on the phone. So you just tap and you go, and the price can fluctuate in some of those places based on the temperature. And. Um... You talked as well about the uh, the KPIs. Um, so when when you're looking across your your marketing mix, would you weight 
the the KPIs is is e-commerce going to be the the platform for customer interaction going forward? Is that the the king? You know, people used to say content is king. I, I think you know if if you don't have uh, a physical structure in your sales channel, then e-commerce is your channel. I think the reality of the of the challenge for people is how do you balance it? Um, you know, you, logic would tell you if you have your eggs in more than one basket, it it, it does mitigate some of the risk. Now, e-commerce uh, as a as a channel is only as effective as your logistics can make it. So during this pandemic, the reason that the Very Group was so much more uh, reactive and successful versus one of our other clients, Next, was Next didn't actually have a warehousing capability that could operate with social distancing. So they had to shut it for 30 days. So they could actually, they have an entire digitization to the ordering process and their customer process was fantastic, but they couldn't physically pack a box digitally or automate, uh, in an automated sense. So that e-commerce piece, it's fine to go harvesting and, and hunting for new customers. If you can't fulfill them, they will run away faster than they came. So you've got to balance it. Um, the other side of it is, you know, think about what Amazon is doing in places like Seattle pre the pandemic, they're opening up bookshops. So, you know, why is Airbnb now starting to create consumer marketing and advertising and branding? Well. It's because of trust and it's because of the physical reality of sometimes people do want to have that interaction. So one one size does not fit all, is that my view. And one platform is never a good idea if there are two or three available. Utilize them in the right balance. We've spent probably um, the best part of, of the session talking about um, organizations that are selling uh, products of one type or another. but would you see the same uh, impact on professional services you mentioned and, and where services are what you're selling rather than physical product? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so so we're, we're a service business. We cover media, creative, data technology, um, AI, uh, VR, robotics. You know, there's a whole range of different services that we have. Um, and in professional services, what the pandemic has proven is technology is is a credible place for you to communicate and, and activate through. Um, it does require a different level of attention. Um, the number of WebExes and Zoom calls we've all done is probably now, you know, stratospherically larger in the last nine months versus the last 20 years. However, we're getting much more done. Um, and I think what it has meant is people now understand that you can build a relationship virtually with people and with a with, with a, a different business uh, but it does require a different set of skills but also a different approach you know we can't talk across each other we've got to be mindful we we, we sort of get slightly bored of saying to people i think you're on mute um but there's a different discipline to our business and actually yeah it can prevail and it does prevail you know the, there are still a lot of major corporations and very small local businesses who are doing very well in this moment in time by utilizing this sort of technology. So yeah, it can be done and I think it will be, continue to be done well. And is there an increasing focus within particularly larger agencies like yourselves to, to have teams that focus purely on behavioral psychology? Is that becoming an area of differentiation for the agencies where you, you talked about Dan as, as an expert in, in human behavior. Yes. Uh, yeah, I think I, I think th there's a there's a bigger amount of information available today than ever before. Now, data and information doesn't necessarily equate to knowledge. You've got to know how to manage it and harvest it and and and, and separate it. Um, I think agencies, uh, big holding company agency groups with strong media or technology backbones need to either invest in creating knowledge for themselves, or they need to go to the syndicated research and information sources, such as the Nielsen's of this world, um, and curate it back from there. But yeah, the opportunity is there, but it's it's a little bit like snow blindness. There's so much of it around. You need experts who can actually you know, sift it through, because 
great marketing or great advertising. It, it really is based upon an understanding of what people may be wishing to do. That's the difference between consumers and customers. Customers, you know what they've done. Consumers, you know what they might do and what they might think. And then there's a level of imagineering. There's a level of bravery and creativity that you'll never find in an algorithm. Uh, and without it, it doesn't work. And you know, for those who believe that the world is technology and data only led, I, I, I strongly disagree with it. All of that is there to help you deliver more impactful, creative, imaginative ideas. And that's why people get excited. And that's why they go and buy things. And if you had a final message then for um, kind of a small small business director uh, who's looking at how they try and emerge into the new normal as it hopefully begins to take shape, um, what's the, the number one takeaway for them in terms of, of e-commerce and how they reach out? So, and it's it's... It's for everybody, I would say, is that the, the world we now live in gives you an opportunity, if you can accept it and take it, to understand so much more about what your customers are and what your consumers are going to be. So knowing your customers and having the opportunity to listen. Everybody talks about CRM and having a dialogue. That is important if you're allowed and given permission to do it. But the most important thing is you've got to listen. And there are so many things that allow you to hear what people do or don't do or what they don't say. If you can do that, you've got a better understanding of them. And with that, you can craft a better message. So whether you're the largest company in the world or a carpet showroom in Leith, you have to listen better because there's, there's things there that will allow you to get greater knowledge from it. And uh, from there, you can prevail and you can do better, is my view. Thanks. Brilliant, you and I, and I love that um, phrase that you used of imagineering and that bringing together the creative and the, the data, you know, so that it's uh, the way to, to reach the audience with, with a powerful message. So thank you. Um, I think, Gail, uh, would you like to say a few words just to close? Absolutely, yes. It's really just up to me to say, to obviously to say thank you very much to you and for taking the time and sharing your thoughts, your ideas, your experiences. I've been scribbling away as you've been talking, um, lots of your advice, your thoughts, your insight, and I know it will be hugely helpful, as will the recording, to feed back into our, our classes so our students can hear it, but also for our academics. And I'm very mindful we have career week in the not too distant future as well, and, and students are grappling with where they want to go and lots of real excitement, I'm sure, in, in digital uh, media. So very, very useful. So thank you for that. Um, obviously, we will share the recording, but really appreciate your time. And uh, I do hope that you will continue to, to stay engaged with the business school um, and we can we can catch up again. Yeah, very much so. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ron, as well, for organising this and uh, and hosting it. Thank you very much, and thanks to everybody who's joined us. Okay. And I'll just mention that there will be a link that gets sent out to everybody.